Welcome to our panel on a new left formation in the US. I will briefly introduce the panelists and, they, and then say some words about what this panel is about and how we will proceed. I start from the right. Um, Bill Fletcher, Jr. is a member of the editorial board of, the, of blackcommentator.com and a senior scholar with the Institute of Policy Studies. He's a union activist and the co-author of the book Solidarity Divided, Closer? Yes. which is a critical examination of labor's current crisis and an outline for a new comprehensive <laughs> social justice strategy. <clears throat> Bill will talk about the role of racism in the crisis and the decline of trade unionism in the US and about possible avenues to rekindle a new labor movement with radical perspective. Then, uh, next to Bill, Raquel Garrido is um, <coughs> the national secretary and international spokeswoman for the French left party, Parti de Gauche, which she co-founded with Jean-Luc Mélenchon in 2008. In 2009, she ran for the European Parliament. Uh, Raquel will talk about the emergence and further perspectives of the Parti de Gauche in France in the context of the recent struggles against neoliberalism. I'm glad to have Raquel on our panel because I think the American left needs to learn the lesson that it is actually possible in certain circumstances to build a new leftist formation. Then, next to me, uh, on my right, Harriet Fratt is a psychotherapist and hypnotherapist in New York City. She writes on issues for personal life in Rethinking Marxism, and in the Journal for, of Psychohistory and others. She's a founding mother of the women's movement in the US, and she will talk about current tendencies in gender relations, the limitations of current feminism, <coughs> and the perspectives of the new feminist socialist perspective. <coughs> Next to me on my left, Rick Wolf is Professor Emeritus of Economics of the University of Massachusetts Amherst and currently teaches at the New School University in New York. He's one of the most acknowledged Marxist economists in the US and has published many articles about the economic crisis. Rick will talk about the new struggles of the labor movement, especially <coughs> in Wisconsin, against the auster austerity politics and will outline a proposal for a public works program with new democratic structures at the workplace, a public works program that combines the fight against unemployment and poverty with the creation of green jobs on a mass scale. And last but not least, uh, to the left, Sean Sweeney is a founder and director of the Global Labor Institute at the Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations. He has done a lot of research on the question of how the labor movement and the ecological movement could build alliances on the national and international level. He is, for instance, the co-author of an excellent international study on transport workers and climate change, one of the, to my knowledge, one of the most progressive trade unionist uh, um, analyses and statements about the ecology that, that I am aware of. He will talk about the current state of the ecological movement, the potentials and weaknesses of the blue-green coalition, and the urgency of developing an eco-socialist perspective and strategy. Now, uh, let me say something about uh, how this uh, panel came into being. The idea to put together this panel came out of a debate between leftists in the US and in Europe in a discussion group called the North Atlantic Left Dialogue. This is a discussion group that's organized by the German Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, which is, as you might know, uh, one of the most important and largest think tanks of the left worldwide. 
in these seminars and discussions, we compare the different conditions of social movements and progressive forces in both continents. We try to exchange experiences. We try to figure out the structural weaknesses and potentials of the left in both, in both continents. And one of the most pertinent issues raised especially by the US participants is the contradiction between the many vibrant movements and initiatives in the US on the one hand and the fragmentations of the progressive forces that are in these movements. Um, the impossibility so far to build a democratic socialist organization that is capable of actually overcoming these fragmentations and of becoming something more than just another sect. I think there is a widespread <laughs> feeling that some new way has to be found to change this condition of powerlessness, of helplessness of the left in the face of an ongoing going dismantling of social services and a still growing divide between rich and poor. All the more as we face new catastrophes almost every single day from the nuclear disaster in Japan to the new war in Libya right now. Now, the subject of our debate today is uh, specifically to look at the fundamental question of what should and what could be the profile of a new leftist formation and how to develop a new coalition uh, and sustainable strategy for the left. I would like to frame the debate by three general remarks or theses, kind of, kind of provocation. First, it is important to learn from leftist parties in Europe and elsewhere, but it would be foolish to mimic them. For instance, by immediately proceeding to found a party. It is well known, and we are uh, very uh, well aware of that we, that the electoral system in the US is fundamentally different uh, from the European ones. Uh, the American winner-takes-all system makes such a leftist party foundation very, very difficult, if not impossible. Um, there might be, at one point, at some time, uh, a wonderful idea how to overcome these difficulties. But if we tried this now, we would immediately run into splits before we even have the chance to get to know our differences. That's why we deliberately chose the term leftist formation, which is meant to express that we are looking for a new aggregate form of connecting progressives that are working in different areas, in different social movements, with different orientation, and also different organizations, stretching from radical socialists to, I would say, maybe that's disputed, to progressive liberals. We don't have a blueprint for such a new aggregate form, but we know from experience that if we started the building process of a leftist formation with a discussion about how to find a party with the right, correct, party line and so on. We would kill the whole process before, we, before it even starts. So I would uh, strongly suggest not to go into this area, uh, but to stick to, to the profile of what could be a leftist formation. Second, a new socialist left cannot restrict itself to either class or gender or race issues, but rather has to connect <coughs> these different areas, has to connect economic demands, social demands, with gender justice and racial justice from the outset. If it turns, for instance, a blind eye to the problems of the environment, it is dead <coughs> in the water at the beginning. Um, it would replicate the devastating split that makes ecology to a small middle class, upper middle class intellectual issues, issue, uh, whereas the popular classes are kept in a kind of denial. <coughs> the same can be said in regards to the urgency of anti-poverty struggles, anti-militarism, anti-imperialism, and so on. That's why we try to focus our debate today on some of the basic cornerstones of a new leftist formation. Not all cornerstones, but some. Um, in the sense of fundamental strategic access that are to be connected in a 
new and non-hierarchical way. Third, a new leftist formation must be a democratic and a pluralistic one. I think that is one of the basic lessons that we have to draw from the failures of different kinds of uh, traditional socialist uh, organizations. It must be able to live with different tendencies without breaking apart. I think the challenge is to learn to organize collective agency on the base of what a comrade from South America has called non-polarized pluralities. Pluralities that are able to work with each other and that are not being polarized against each other, so that's the whole uh, issue for part. And this is also true for the fundamental split between so-called reformist tendencies and so-called revolutionary tendencies, a split that has haunt, haunted not only the labor movement in its history, but also other social movements. You, you know that all well, the reformers traditionally stick to the near goals and risk to drop the far goals from their agenda, and in this way are being absorbed and gobbled up by the system, while the so-called revolutionaries proclaim the far goals without getting any foothold in popular common sense. And I think it's important for <coughs> any new leftist formation that has any possibility to survive to develop a self-critical relation to our own history, which in that case means it's not always the fault of the others. It's not always the failure of the others. The weakness of the left is more, of, more often than not on both sides, on the reformistic side and on the so-called revolutionary mm -hmm. side. Um, Rosa Luxemburg coined the interesting concept of a revolutionary realpolitik, realpolitik, real politics, uh, a term, a concept that has been, that she uh, coined with the intention to reconnect concrete reforms with fundamental perspectives of a social, socialist transformation. Uh, some <coughs> theorists in the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in particular, Michael Brie have tried to break down this, this approach of Rosa Luxemburg with the concept of entry projects. That is, common sense projects that allow broad alliances um, of the labor movement, of uh, poor people's movements, of the middle classes, um, or part of the middle class at least, um, broad alliances and combine concrete reforms and democratic socialist perspectives. <laughs> when we now get to the different cornerstones, uh, we will try to identify some possible entry projects. Every panelist will speak about 12 minutes. We will then open the floor for debate and we try to do the debate in a way that as many people as possible uh, have the uh, possibility and the occasion to speak up, which means that we would like to limit the, 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 the time uh, to three minutes. Um, so, afterwards, at the end, toward the end of our meeting, uh, when we get to the final round of the panelists, every panelist should address the concrete question in the final statement, what is to be done to get from where we are now to the new leftist formation we envision. So, and uh, we proceed now in the following order. The first uh, speaker is Raquel, our guest speaker, then Rick, then Bill, then Sean, and then Harry. Okay, Raquel, go ahead. Hi there, is this working? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jan. It's very, it's very honor, it's an honor, honor for me to be here. Uh, thank you all so much for getting up early this Sunday. Um, and it's fr frankly flattering that uh, our little uh, success story there in France um, <coughs> would be considered as you know, dignified enough for you guys to hear about it. Uh, but I think you are actually right in doing so. And in any case, our own experience in launching our party in our left front was that uh, international inspiration did help not only in uh, general theoretical or programmatic 
points, but also in very concrete, uh, you know, making of way to proceed um, aspects of things. So I'm going to try to come back um, to a certain historical points in time so that you can maybe understand the underlying um, reasoning in the foundation of our party. The, probably the most important point, starting point of all of this was the year 2005 where you had in France a referendum um, where the French people were asked whether they approved the ratification of the European Constitutional Treaty. The European Constitutional Treaty was a new um, regional integration instrument by which the core principles of European integration were enshrined in a new, more powerful legal status they called constitutional. Um, although although uh, in France, uh, European integration is something very, um, very embodied in, in the left reasoning, and obviously all of the, the, the European left is very, you know, um, afraid of national comebacks and, the, f and, and the, the memory of, you know, confrontation between Germans and French and, and any other uh, nationality, uh, in especially in periods of, of crisis, uh, high un unemployment is very fresh. So there's this fear that, you know, uh, it's, it's wrong to come back go forward, backwards on the European construction. But this analysis, this peaceful analysis, uh, brought the European social democracy to be totally blind uh, on the real aspects of what this European construction was effectively doing. And um, one bet that had been done by the European social democrats uh, being that the economical integration would bring about political integration was had been lost over the years. And not only political integration, by which I mean the possibility of European citizens to actually have a say in those European policies by democratic means, uh, was not coming about, but actually the perspective of that was even getting further and further away over the years because of of uh, the new countries coming in, and now we're 27, and everything is done by European capitalism to keep citizens very much away from uh, political power at the European level. And so what you have is rules, or rules that um, force countries to privatize public services, to have um, free trade, free circulation of capital, to put all of the European peoples in a, what is a really economical war, among each other, and this is creating very high tension. And um, at some point, at least my group, we were in the Socialist Party, we, we, we just realized that if we did not take the leadership in, in the radical criticism of this European construction on a left-wing <coughs> basis, there was a historical fight between us and the extreme right, and that the left would lose that, that fight because they were the only ones who were taking that fight, that lead against, against the European Union. But they were not doing, obviously, on a left-wing basis for more social rights and more democratic rights to implication, right? They were doing it on a racist point of view. But on the other side, the Social Democrats were being just so like, okay, free trade is great, or, you know, there was, well, there was nothing there to, 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 to eat for anyone who was trying to defend his wage, to defend his, his um, you know, uh, welfare state, uh, rights, etc. So this time we had a tool, the referendum, and we had to have an opinion. And, and the history of Europe was going to be seriously affected by all of this. So we decided that we were going to campaign for the no, that this time we had to vote no, because no opened at least the possibility of renegotiating. Whereas yes, a yes vote definitely closed that door and window uh, and, and trying all these ultra-liberal principles in the European text, which was very, very bad, as I just said, for any left-wing construction in Europe. So we decided to actually go against our party in that vote. And we became sort of um, 
a little heroic group inside of the left, uh, the general left, because we were, you know, we were disagreeing with um, with the party and we were campaigning. And so this is that point where Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the the, the, um, the chairman of our of our group, he was a socialist senator, senator. He had been minister, and he became very very known in the public because of this. So what you had was a sort of dream team in that campaign in 2005, where you had Jean-Luc Mélenchon. You had Marie-Georges Buffet, she was General Secretary of the Communist Party. You had Olivier Besancenot, he was the spokesperson of um, the Communist League, which was a Trotskyist group. And you had José Bové, who was a, a farmer uh, union leader, who had been very, um, you know, mediatized in the previous years. And all this, like, this dream team went together, campaigned, and actually in that campaign, there was hundreds of local local groups and what these local groups were doing was just reading the text and our argument was in, uh, in French it works it's in dans électeur il y a lecteur in voter there's reader read and you'll vote no so we were just organizing reading groups this is what this is our campaign was reading groups we just brought the text and first of all the text was like this so our first argument was to say this you just have to vote no because they don't want you to understand what's in here. So <laughs> this is why this is so thick. So this, you know, you should be beware of this or just right at the outset. And then look at this article. We would give it, hand out the documents, and um, okay, we just ask someone to read. Okay, just read. Okay, it is prohibited to give any subvention to uh, um, uh, enterprises in the public services. Okay, what what does that mean? Uh, and people would start talking and then realizing that any sort of left-wing program was totally forbidden by this text and that it made no sense to continue in a, in a simulacre of, of combat between left and right-wing ideas in a context where anything was in reality f forbidden by international, uh, at least European law, I don't know. So we, we published a, one, uh, a, a leaflet, the Electeur, Ya Electeur, we actually sold it because we had no money, right? And it was sold that more than one million <coughs> people were buying this like, like little breads because the media was giving no information and this is our first real big internet victory because internet put, like, just exploded all the, the normal you know, canals of, of information. And we won, and we won and the no won because what we actually need is to get rid of oligarchy, of all the ancien regime. So, you know, in Ecuador, they were talking about partidocracia. Um, in Argentina, que se vayan todos, you know, out with all of them. This was something that you know, rang a bell for us in Europe and especially in France. So when it came to Germany, the foundation of Die Linke, and the, dis the, the dissolution of the Communist Party, and the fact that Oscar Lafontaine left the SPD, we were, we, they invited us, and we just like, started getting all this pressure saying, we have to do something in France. And all, not only because this is, this is so fun, but it's also, because, it's also because if we don't, there's the Italian scenario, you know, where all the left finally goes into something, a, a, a political zone which, which is very in the center, where the, the, the left always goes further right, further right, further right. You have <coughs> oceans of people no, no longer in democracy because you have low turnouts and you have this apparent democracy where only people in the center, like the United States, <laughs> okay? So, uh, but then where you have no one uh, in Italy today calling himself socialist or communist in the parliament, not a single one. So we decided in 2008 uh, in, a, in a congress, we structured all the little left-wing currents in the party and all together, you know, all wet and all, we got 18%. And we decided that was a failure and we just left that same night. We said, okay, this is, this is it, we leave. And we were a small group. We had media attention and all, and we had some sort of, you know, prestige because of the 2005 battle, but we were a small group. And so lots of people were saying, this is, you know, you, th you're going nowhere with this. So we tried to be smart about it and try to prepare bef abo above hand. This is all, you know, very secret information on how to do things. But Jan told me to be, asked me to be specific <laughs> on these questions. We actually prepared beforehand 
certain groups that we had been talking with, especially uh, in environmental groups or other projects, small small groups and boutiques on the left, that were that said to us, oh, "Listen, guys, if you leave the Socialist Party, we'll go. We, we dissolve our own group and we're coming." So we got two or three groups of like these people <laughs> or, or, or leaders from trade unions, people that you know had had um, uh, not notoriety. And so we said, okay, we're leaving. And we had, went to a press conference and said, we're leaving uh, the party and we have a new one. We just printed like on a paper like this. It said, let's call it the left party, the Parti de Gauche. Just like that. Because we don't want to go into a uh, socialist, communist, whatever, uh, environmentalist, feminist, the, 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 the super long name. So that's that's just, just too complicated. And we're more ambitious, actually. We're very ambitious, very, very ambitious. And our ambition is to reunify all the other left, what we call the other left. And we started inventing vocabulary because we were not satisfied with being, you know, pushed aside and marginalized in, with, in categories like extreme gauche, extreme gauche. We said, okay, the other, we're gonna reunify all the other left because actually we're the real left. Okay, with the inspiration of what our French brothers and sisters have been able to do, and as we all know, it's been hundreds of years that folks like us have had to thank the French people for what they were able to do, <laughs> uh, and take our models uh, from them uh, with, with gratitude <coughs> and remembering Jan's careful advice not to mimic although most of the time here in the United States, mimicking wouldn't have been such a bad idea. Um, let me begin by describing the small scale at which we have, in fact, done something uh, like <clears throat> what was just described. The remarkable thing about Wisconsin, I think, is the following. That everything from a progressive portion of the Democratic Party which was able to decide to do unusual things, like run away to another state so that the state police couldn't collect them. Uh, the trade union leadership, obviously, but perhaps most important, surprising Republicans and Democrats alike and union leaders as well, those who have been honest enough to say so, was a gathering of support beyond anything any of them had imagined. And what we actually had there for a while, and we still have, is an extraordinary coming together of people, many, many of whom are busy in specific organizations around specific issues that really have very little to do with public employment or the issues that came up. But they were able to recognize in the attempt to destroy collective bargaining uh, an assault that cut across, didn't obliterate, but cut across all of their other concerns so they had to stop working on those, some of those other issues and come together and occupy that building, that public building in Madison and produce a mass outpouring that shows what is possible here in the United States. There are lots of other evidence, but here was a concrete demonstration of the kind of unity around a strong left position that the fragmented American left and lots of other people could agree on. So we have every reason to be extraordinarily pleased and hopeful by what that represented. There are, of course, differences among the people who got together, and those differences will have to be worked out or they will not be able to continue. All of that's true, but that doesn't diminish the milestone that was reached in what is now beginning to be a return and revival of the American left that some of us have been predicting that those of us who have been doing so now feel very confident <laughs> that we were at least on the right track and that signs are moving in that direction. The bulk of my time I'd like to spend on something else. And the way to get into this is to remind everyone here of a little bit of American left history. The last time capitalism <coughs> collapsed in the way that it has now was in the 1930s. But the lessons of the 1930s are crucial for us to keep in mind in terms of how we try to build a new left 
formation here in the United States, as Jan outlined it. In the 1930s, a number of things happened <coughs> that we need to remember. First, the President of the United States at that time came under enormous political pressure from below that was mounted by an explosive joining of trade unions. As explosive in the CIO as it swept across basic American industry, as, in a sense, this Wisconsin event was. A sudden <coughs> explosion. Of course, it had different consequences. It lasted a long time. We'll see what happens as state governments across this country do what the government of <coughs> Wisconsin was doing. But the trade union movement became very quickly very strong. And we also had strong socialist and communist parties of various kinds. And they together put an enormous pressure on President Roosevelt. So he, for example, did two important things <coughs> that he wouldn't have done otherwise. And the reason we know he wouldn't have done otherwise is we see what the current president is doing. First thing he did was create a massive program of public employment. 11 million jobs were created <coughs> by the federal government who hired those people. We moved those numbers up to the parry with the population increase, we'd have about 25 million. That's about it. That would do an enormous thing to undo the unemployment now. So he was forced to have a public employment pro program of staggering proportions relative to what do we have today. No government program of federal employment, and neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party is even debating whether to have it or how to have it or what to make it do. What a stunning difference in the lesson there. The second thing the Union, Socialists, and Communists of the 1930s forced the government to do is a massive program of real reform. Unemployment insurance, we never had that before in America. The social security system to take care of people at the end of their work lives, we never had that before. A serious reform of the banking system Glass-Steagall, which separated investment banking <coughs> from commercial banking so that you could not risk the depositor's money in the investment process, at least not directly. Those were, and I haven't finished all of them, those were remarkable reforms. Nothing comparable is being suggested today. Nothing remotely comparable. The financial regulation that was passed last year is a bad joke. It embarrasses. Central to it was the idea we have financial institutions that are, in a stunning phrase that only Americans could invent, too big to fail. And as a result of all the reforms, those same institutions, I'll mention two, Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, as a result of each of them separately being too big to fail, we have now the situation that they merged. <laughs> There's now one Bank of America that owns Merrill Lynch. It is much bigger and can now go to the government and be bailed out next time on the grounds that it is, it is to coin a new phrase, too bigger to fail. <laughs> Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. We have no comparable result now in a crisis that is comparable in its proportions. Not quite the same unemployment level, to be sure but a crisis of major proportions. What's the lesson here that I think we can draw? We don't have the organizations now. Our trade unions have been in a 50-year decline. Our socialist and communist parties barely exist, and their influence comparable. And so there is no comparable pressure from below. And the need for that, to make this crisis not be a moment in the further consolidation of a, of a malignant kind of capitalism, which is what the other side is trying to do. But to be the kind of change, we then have to learn the lessons of the 1930s, and that's what I like to conclude with. Those lessons are crucial. We need a new left formation because the alternative is what we are seeing. And we can do that. And we can do it around, first of all, an entry level, an immediate demand, not for some far-flung radical notion, but simply for the repetition now of what was done in the 1930s. There it was the result of a left-wing mobilization. Maybe this time it can be the catalyst 
for a left-wing mobilization, to remind people that we can have a government that puts people to work, that Lord knows we have the capacity to do it, we certainly have the need to do it, we now have the coexistence of this capitalism, which continues to refer to itself as a paragon of efficiency. We have the coming together of tens of millions of unemployed and underemployed people. One quarter of our industrial capacity, the government says, is standing idle. Factories, offices, tools, equipment, space. That's the official number. One quarter of our industrial capacity, and the one quarter basically our labor force unemployed, or underemployed. The resulting loss in wealth that could solve all of our social problems is, is si simply indicated by those numbers. So clearly, a demand for a government employment program would be an extremely popular, galvanizing moment for a new left formation to endorse. Just as the polls show extraordinary support around the United States for the workers in Wisconsin, they would also show that for a program of immediate governmental employment. We could even replicate the creative ways that was done in the 1930s. The WPA, the cultural programs, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which in many ways deserves to be called our first federal green program, can be the model, even though it's 75 years old. But here's the crucial difference that I want to conclude on this. We should not simply replicate a government employment program. And the reason is, it lacks something. We know it lacks something because we know what happened to the programs and the reforms that were won in the 1930s. Because we didn't take another step at that time, they were lost. Glass-Steagall was repealed by President Clinton and the Congress in the late 1990s. Social Security has been nibbled at, attacked, and is now being more systematically attacked. All the reforms have been reduced, pulled away, just like the programs that were hoped for were never realized. Here's the punchline. What we can do this time, and what we ought to do, and what a group of us are working on doing, is having a government program with a radical new dimension. A government employment program that doesn't only give people a job, but gives them a job in a new kind of enterprise that was never thought of in the 30s. Here's the enterprise. It's an enterprise in which workers who have a government job are become, will become and will function as their own board of directors. No shareholders, no stockholders, no external decision-making apparatus. The workers will become <coughs> workers cum bosses. They will work Monday to Thursday on their job, and Friday they will get together and make the decisions of what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the surpluses. They will have to coordinate with one another, and they will have to coordinate with the civil society in which they work, of course, just as capitalist businesses do that now, although in a different way as bespeaks their different objectives. This would create, for the first time, a concrete way for workers to, if you pardon the language, not only produce a surplus, but also appropriate, distribute, and make the decisions about how that surplus gets produced. That gives them a power that workers never before here had. It's that rethinking of what an enterprise ought to be that might allow us in a public works program to have an entry level project, a project immediately understood and sanctioned by a mass of the American people, but to have it in a form that opens a new space for individuals to see another way of living, another way of working. I think that could be a wildfire in terms of the support it would get. It would give all Americans a chance to see what that kind of work would be, what that kind of enterprise is, what kind of experience you have as a worker in such a situation. I've been going around the country talking about this. All I can tell you <coughs> is that the response from trade union meetings and others is everywhere electric for such an option, for such a possibility. And it's a concrete demand that mixes in a way, as Jan said, reform a public employment program 
with something more than reform, a radical new way to understand what a business enterprise is and can be. And if we were to add to it that it could be a program focused on a greening of America, on a serious engagement with a social commitment to radically alter the pollution and the waste of energy, we would bring in yet a whole nother constituency of excitement and support for it. It has the elements then of a kind of framework and basis for a new left formation that takes us beyond saying we need to overcome fragmentation, which we obviously do, but to give it a focus and a, a framework that cashes in on the potential for bringing these different constituencies together the way they did for a moment there in Wisconsin. But this, of course, would be a long-term transformational project that I think is worth our taking seriously. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to thank you, and uh, it's good to see many friends uh, here. I thought this was working. It's not? No. It's not working? It's working. Yeah. It's working. Yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. We'll be right here. Um, let me just, uh, I just want to introduce uh, my co-author and very, very good friend, Fernando Gapacin, who honors me by being here on the panel today. Yay. And I want to begin on a different note. Um, uh, by admitting that I was wrong, I was very wrong, that the idiots attacked Libya. Um, and I really did not think... This won't work, so I'm going to talk like this. I want to admit that I was wrong, the idiots attacked Libya this, uh, today, and I really, it's just, I had to say something. I was just walking here today and I was looking at the paper, I'm saying, my God, what are these people thinking about? Right? I mean, I really thought when I saw Gates' comments a few weeks ago that they got it, that this would be really stupid. Right? Um, but nevertheless, they've decided to do it. And my comment about this is just that as someone who definitely supports the rebels, nevertheless, this is a civil war, and the United States and Europe need to stay the hell out of it. And it's really important that we distinguish our views about the internal situation in Libya from what the US and the EU are doing. And I just wanted to start there because I am really pissed. And I don't like to be wrong. Um, so, in 11 minutes, um, let me outline a few things. One is, uh, I would uh, identify five central theses in order to understand the decline of the U.S. labor movement. The first is the uh, Cold War, and the Cold War with the corresponding purge of much of the left from organized labor, the declaration of peace in our time by uh, labor vis-a-vis -vis capital, the increased uh, racial and gender narrowness of, of organized labor, and in fact, an imperial compromise. That is, a decision uh, by the, the leaders of organized labor, and in fact, much of the membership, to put uh, 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 muffs, earmuffs, over them, over their ears, to not hear the cries of people being oppressed by US imperialism. Uh, a second is the abandonment of a social movement orientation uh, by much of the uh, organized labor. And it was sometimes justified by the impact of Taft-Hartley, but it really does relate to this issue of peace in our time. A third thing is the lack of a strategic organizing approach and decreasing capacity to move comprehensive campaigns uh, on, on any level of scale, in part uh, as a result of a loss of political will, and in part as a result of the loss of uh, great leftist uh, strategists. A fourth thing, fourth point is the changes in capitalism, including technology, the relocation of industry, which is um, incorrectly called deindustrialization, 
as well as the growth of what people are increasingly called a precarious, which I think is a brilliant term. And the fifth is a corporate offensive that began in the 1970s. And right now what we're watching is what I would call the final offensive. Uh, that, that right now, this is not simply with the right wing looking for a better deal or to weaken labor. They're looking to take it out, to take it out of the equation in, entirely. Um, in order to further understand uh, the weaknesses of U.S. labor, we've got to understand that when people talk about the growth of class collaboration on the part of much of labor, you've got to understand that that's deeply rooted in racist and imperial consciousness, which pr created the fabric upon which a practice of class collaboration could in fact emerge. <laughs> And, and insofar as a large section of the white working class increasingly saw its identity, its interest as linked to that of, of a white elite, it was impossible for them to, to do anything other than to continue to hold on to the notion of an American dream, which for many of us was an American nightmare. Um, this holding on to the American dream is directly related to this particular response to the crisis that we see of right-wing populism, which has a very long history in the United States, going back at least to the 1830s. And there's an incredible book that if you haven't read it, you have to, Right-Wing Populism in America by uh, Chip Burley and Matthew Lyons, which really gives a very, very good historical examination of this so that we understand that phenomena like the Tea Party are not new. Um, and, and did not just simply emerge, but are, are con connected to the racial and settler origins of, of the United States. Um, so what are the sources of renewal? A few things. One, uh, Rick was just talking about Wisconsin. I'm going to actually start with the Arab Revolt. Um, I don't think that Wisconsin would have happened had there not been an Arab Democratic Revolt. Um, I think what we would have seen in Wisconsin would have been one day, massive demonstration, a lot of people, great speeches, everyone would have then gone home, shaken their hands, started crying, and accepted that we got our asses kicked again. That's what I think would have happened. That's the tried and true U.S. tradition, right? <laughs> Instead, something different happened. And what's interesting, and this is not just a supposition, it, it, it's based on discussions with journalists who were on the ground and were talking to people about what in fact inspired them to decide to stay. And two out of three people were saying the Arab revolt. So it's important that we understand that these global, um, that, that the, there really is this global connection that people are picking up. And uh, it, was, it was absolutely phenomenal. The Wisconsin brought together not simply trade unionists, but it was, it was um, interesting to see tractors driving through <laughs> Wisconsin, uh, students. But, but let me say one other thing. You may, many of you may remember that there was this deputy attorney general out of Indiana that suggested using live ammunition against the protesters. Had those protesters been black, they would have used live ammunition. It was very important that this was white folks, largely, that were in massive numbers, that were very angry, and were doing something progressive. I think that had it been something different, had it been black folks or Latinos, not only might they have used live ammunition, but it would have been something that would have been very easy to write off as simply, there go those angry black folks again. And disconnecting that experience from the experience that millions of other people, and particularly millions of other white people, have been feeling. So I think that that was a very, very important uh, thing. The, um, but what, one of the limitations, what we saw in Wisconsin, is that, and, and, and please understand me, I'm not trying to trash this at all because I think it was phenomenal, but one of the limitations is that it's not enough for us to be on a defensive. We have to have an alternative program. I mean, one of the things before, um, 
before Wisconsin that I said on a number of occasions uh, was that it was important for us to actually not think about being in February or March of 2011, but better to think about being February or March 1942. And in February and March 1942, what did you have? You had the Nazis racing across North Africa, heading towards the Suez Canal and the oil areas. You had the, the, uh, the Germans were stopped outside of Moscow, primarily because they miscalculated when they invaded, had the wrong uniforms and froze to death. But they were renewing their strategy, preparing to move on this little town called Stalingrad. There were islands in the Pacific that were collapsing one after another. And in February and March 1942, the Philippines had not yet fallen. There was absolutely no basis for optimism. None. No basis for optimism. People could have sat around and just simply cried and cried and <coughs> cried in despair at what was unfolding. But what was important was not simply the defensive battle. What was important was the notion of the development of a theory of the counteroffensive. And one of the problems in our social movements is that we're so used to getting our asses kicked and we're so used to fighting on the defensive that we rarely stop and say, wait a minute, how do we take out the other side? And I'm not even just talking about the ultimate taking them out. I don't mean violently, of course. <laughs> Uh, I just have to be clear because, you know, I don't, I don't want to, Glenn Beck and everything. Um, uh, I'm saying that we have to have a strategy that thinks about what is the nature of the counteroffensive. And when we're thinking about, for example, defending the public sector, it's not simply enough to say we need more resources in the public uh, sector because people are angry about the public sector's inability to solve the needs that the population is facing. We've got to talk about saving and changing the public sector. When we're looking at education, we have to have a program that's addressing the fact that people don't want their kids educated in our schools the way our schools currently are, but they do want public education. They don't want to have to pay as their income declines. So what is our program? That's what I'm saying. We've got to have the theory of the counteroffensive. Otherwise, any good fighter will tell you that you can never remain on a defensive and ever expect to win. That at some point you have to throw punches, and you have to throw punches aimed at knocking out the other side, not simply pushing them away. So I'm going to, um, there's many, many other things I was going to say, but I'm out of time, I think. And so let me just end with this, that none of this works, as, as was pointed out by the previous two speakers, none of this works without a solid left. And, and uh, the, the difficulty <coughs> is that with the collapse of many left experiments, too many of us have fallen into either NGOism, that is, we feel that we can mount the struggle simply through jobs that we occupy in 501c3s, or we do it simply by limiting ourselves to very individual social movements, and then others simply by giving good speeches and reading good poems. Um, the, the, we need a different kind of formation, and we need to be operating on multiple levels. And one of the things that I will end by saying in terms of Wisconsin is that it showed the importance of the electoral and the mass. Had the masses of people in Wisconsin not shown up and not stayed, I'd put a dollar to a donut, the Democrats would never have left town. They would have given good speeches as they surrendered, but they left. But I'd add to this, and some of my friends may disagree with me, I think that if the Democrats hadn't decided to stay in Illinois and push the envelope, many of the people that showed up in Madison would have gone home. It was this dialectical relationship between the two that brought forward this immense amount of energy, the likes of which we haven't seen in quite some time. Thank you.
Okay, Sean. Oh, yeah, the mic, sorry. The mic, the mic. Good, good. I'm going to take my glasses off, which means I won't be able to see you, but I might be able to see, see the notes. <laughs> Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. right. It's hard to, obviously hard to follow these rich and inspiring contributions. My contribution, I want to stake out what I think is the sort of general territory uh, a new left formation might um, occupy uh, around the climate issue in particular, um, but we can lump in the environment generally, I think. The, the sort of left opinion on this sort of spans a spectrum. I think we need to be aware of that. I'm sure many people in this room are aware of it. Um, I will say parenthetically, though, I did a word search for this wonderful conference, the word climate. And I found four panels which referred to climate. And I thought that was encouraging because a dozen years ago, maybe five years ago, there wouldn't have been any. But when you think of the number of panels and you think of the severity of the climate crisis, Perhaps there should be more discussion on the climate crisis and solutions to it uh, from, a left, uh, from a left point of view. Um, at the one end of this spectrum of left opinion, there's, uh, I would put, start with the right side of the issue, there are those who imagine there's such a thing as a Green New Deal. And at the other end, there's those who assert that it's really system change which is really going to solve the climate crisis and it takes a sort of much more anti-capitalist revolutionary perspective. <laughs> uh, let's start with the, um, the Green New Deal. Um, adherents of the Green New Deal um, include a lot of unions and a significant but not dominant segment of capital at the moment in the US. Uh, this is probably true internationally as well. The majority of the main environmental organizations, the non-membership organizations, are also sort of very locked into this Green New Deal perspective. Uh, the theoretical premise of the Green New Deal is ecological modernization. This is not a phrase that's used a lot in the US left, it's used more internationally. Um, but it's basically rests on the view that capitalism need not be changed in any qualitative way in order to become green and true sustainability to be accomplished. It needs to adapt, become more efficient, and recognize the limits of natural capital by putting a price on natural capital. Growth then can continue, but growth needs to be delinked from environmental damage, such as emissions of greenhouse gases and so on. And the sort of characters associated with this are all familiar names. Al Gore, Jeffrey Sachs, Nick Stern, Van Jones, Carl Pope, and quite a few union leaders, those who've got the time or the willingness to actually think about it. They all sort of share this perspective. And, but in the US, ecological modernization has some distinct features. The first one is it's extremely nationalistic. So the, the discourse around this in the US context is um, rebuild America, build it here, protect American <coughs> manufacturing in particular, but also assert American capital into the new green economy in a way so we can kick some ass against the Chinese finally. And that's the kind of the basic nationalistic discourse that goes on. Anybody who's been to the Good Jobs Green Jobs conferences uh, with the steelworkers at the backbone of that effort, but also some corporations will have heard this in pretty much every contribution of all the speakers. Now, it's important to know that the policy groups around the labor movement in particular, Apollo Alliance, uh, the Economic Policy Institute, the Center for American Progress, um, do good work in many ways, but they also subscribe to this very nationalistic point of view. Now, John asked me to comment on the Blue-Green Alliance. I mean, from, the, from a distance, the Blue-Green Alliance is an encouraging development. Ten unions now, four environmental organizations, changing the discourse around work and environment. Um, that organization is a bag of contradictions right now. It's got a lot of uh, corporate money involved in it. It's also, uh, in terms of financing its work and its conferences, it is very weak on climate protection. In fact, the Blue-Green Alliance unions could not support Obama's weak commitment, and it was a verbal commitment, of a 17% reduction on greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 based on 2005 levels. Don't let these numbers fool you. Most of you probably know that this is completely inadequate, nowhere near where the science says those emissions reductions need to be by 2020. Now, from the perspective of trying to build a new left formation in the US, it's important to stress, though, that there is a left wing of the Green New Deal that I think is a, a 
rising in strength and also uh, worthy of, um, of uh, paying attention to. It's not necessarily or consciously anti-capitalist or socialist, but it's more left in the sense that imagines a much bigger role for the government, uh, a more radical shift in the culture, more democratic input. And here I would situate the likes of Bill McKibben, 350.org, One Sky, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth. One or two unions, even four or five maybe, are kind of open to this kind of perspective. Uh, largely because, and we'll come back to this in a moment, for the reasons Rick said. They understand that private markets is not, are not going to generate significant numbers of green jobs, but the public sector can and should move into this space. Now, further to the left of the spectrum of opinion, there's the climate justice movement. This movement sort of grew out of Durban, South Africa, around some real struggles around fossil fuel extraction, new dams, new coal mines, etc. Um, but it has its roots in the global justice movement that uh, emerged out of Seattle. It's uh, the, the small farmers movement has become, many of you would, I'm sure, know this, organizations like Via Campesina have arrived on the stage of, uh, <coughs> of history, really, in the last dozen years or so, and have put forward extremely radical positions on environment and agriculture. Um, that movement has little or no faith in global processes like the UN and emphasizes direct action. It organized 100,000 people in Copenhagen for the UN talks in December 2009. On the global diplomatic stage, Bolivia has been the country that most sort of represents this perspective. Its Rights of Mother Earth Conference uh, uh, really um, uh, attracted many people. <coughs> now, the rest of the left, the socialist left, don't pay much attention to climate change, has to be said. How am I doing for time? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I forgot to do my stop. Okay. Sorry, yeah. It's and, also interesting, so I forgot okay. to <laughs> But now, for, from the point of view of a new left formation and the spirit of revolutionary real politique, the, um, if a new <coughs> formation happened tomorrow, it must provide space, I believe, for those two perspectives. System change on the one side and engage for those who are fighting for a left Green New Deal. The, if viewed in terms of, um, it can be viewed in terms of a transitional program, it could be reviewed in terms of a minimum or maximum program. Um, either way, these orientations then become compatible with each other and not contradictory. It should, though, reject ecological modernization. The idea that we can grow on forever, all we need is a bit more efficiency, is absolutely groundless theoretically, it's groundless empirically, and it's undesirable from any social justice or socialist perspective. So we can reject that. We can also reject the economic nationalism that that's wrapped up into. I would argue that there's lots of strong case to be made for local jobs, for local economies, but it does not have to be couched in economic nationalistic language. And that development model and process can be put forward. System change, that perspective, captures what needs to be done. Human civilization is threatened in a way that, uh, in a way that it's never been threatened at any point in its history. I think that's a fairly sound statement. The severity of the crisis is such that the revolution should have happened yesterday. But fighting for a Green New Deal will reveal the incapacity of private markets, even with policies that enable the green economy to deliver. A class struggle approach to the Green New Deal is therefore necessary. It provides a new left formation with a way to connect with unions, environmental justice organizations, and climate organizations. System change posed on its own would not allow for day-to-day -day and pragmatic engagement of those movements, at least not in this moment and not in the United States. Opportunities, and I'll, I'll try to sum up in a, in a minute or so. Um, what might the main kind of positions, for want of a better word, of a new left formation be. And of course, it's not for me or anybody in this room to say what they should be, but these are some offering some thought. First of all, it must acknowledge the scientific evidence. There's a lot of, when the debates happen in the labor movement in the US, and I'm right in the middle of those debates, I, I hesitate to say, uh, it's not a, not, not a pleasant experience, but when those debates happen and they hear what the science says needs to be done in terms of emissions reductions and in terms of the time frame, they all burst out laughing. They all say, well, that's not possible. Well, well, you'll say that to the Greenland ice sheet, say that to the, um, you know, the uh, malaria victims in Central Africa who are dying because of climate change. 
it's not a discussion um, that is a, it's a pleasant one. So we have to start, though, with the scientific evidence, and the policy and the solutions have to follow what needs to be done from a scientific perspective, not in terms of what's politically pragmatic at the present moment. The large polluters must be brought into social ownership, beginning with the energy sector. The Koch brothers are a good example, but look at the behavior of the coal, oil, and gas industries uh, in the United States today. They are crying out to be nationalized, and we need a campaign around that that says, from a climate point of view, from a social point of view, from a democratic point of view, we need to take over the energy se sector. And just look at what happened in Japan with the nuclear disaster. If people had had some real input, as they tried to do in Japan back in the, when those uh, reactors were built, we wouldn't be in the situation we are today. Public works, echoing what Rick said. Massive energy conservation. 40% of emissions comes from buildings to, to basically retrofit every building in the United States and every new building going up, make it zero carbon, would create an enormous amount of jobs. They would largely pay for themselves in terms of energy conservation, and that would be a good cornerstone for a global green, a green, green, a left green new deal. And I mentioned relocalization of the, co the economy uh, with an eye to uh, work with movements on a new development model to reframe the commons discussion, oppose carbon trading, reduce emissions <coughs> and, uh, as a public good, and climate solidarity. The idea that the, there's an overdevelopment going on in the north and a distorted development going on in the south which tries to replicate what's going on in the north, it's heading for a disaster. Social growth, not endless capitalist exploitation. I think if we put out, though, maybe that's just my view, we need a more debate on what that would be. It's not the same as the Green Party, which wins the range from eco-socialists on the one end to people who are pretty sympathetic to the green industries, pretty pro sympathetic to capitalism. It's a spectrum that we don't want to replicate in a new left formation. Thank you, and I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about what went wrong with the feminist movement and propose an alternative. As a founding mother of the feminist movement, looking at what we have and haven't achieved, I have a platform to present to you in very brief form, because I have about 12 minutes, as well as some thoughts. Okay, then I'll go over there in hopes of accomplishing this better. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to hold it. Oh, good. Okay, so we tried like this. Uh, I think you have to what How's they call that? kiss the microphone. Well, nobody else was kissing the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, 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 oh, no, no, that would get tiring. Well, anyway, what went wrong with the feminist movement? Put it no. Can't hear? Why is that? What went wrong with the feminist movement? How's that? Maybe I'll just yell. What went wrong with the feminist movement? How's that? Forget this. I'll yell. One huge problem was that North America did not have a mass socialist or communist movement to create class consciousness here. The women's movement grew out of the anti-Vietnam War movement and the New Left movements, which were not theoretically sophisticated, even though they were very enthusiastic. Whatever, in addition, whatever class consciousness our movement had was usurped by the heavy funding and highly clever and, su and successful organizing of the CIA under the clever leadership of Gloria Steinem, founder of MIS. There's a, there are excellent materials on this I can give people later. Her job was facilitated by our theoretical na naivete and our lack of class awareness. The feminist movement with its heavy CIA funding, they also did a big job on the black movement, but that's another topic, lost its mass base and class dimension. It devolved into separate projects of interest to the female gender, such as groups for abortion rights, groups for the protection of battered women, and groups, or umbrella groups like now, National Organization for Women, that worked on passing legislation that protected women within our two-capitalist party system. 
There was another fundamental error in the feminist movement, which is particularly relevant now. We understandably wanted to enter the valued, rewarded, economically and powerfully um, rewarded areas of life from which we were excluded. We wanted jobs, we wanted careers, we wanted economic independence, we wanted intellectual and social and political power. After all, those are the sectors that are acknowledged and rewarded in American culture. Of course, those are very worthy goals. However, as the saying goes, women who want equality with men lack ambition. <laughs> We also shared in our society's devaluation of the knowledge, wisdom, and value learned from sustaining vulnerable lives, maintaining the, and um, creating the conditions of life and performing emotional labor. Those powerful life-affirming knowledges were unspecified, unexplored, and largely devalued then as they still are today. Young American women benefited from the gains that feminists fought for and won. After all, we did win near equity within the American current system, which has the greatest inequality of any Western industrialized nation. Something's obviously missing. For these reasons and more, I'll, which I'll try to explain, and in spite of impressive gender gains. The current feminist movement is overwhelmingly dismissed and devalued by young American women. A major gender transformation and a transformation of feminist life and personal life has happened largely outside of the ken of left or feminist consciousness. What happened is that in 1970, <coughs> The American dream for whites, because this was the white dream, wasn't true of minorities or women who supported their families, it was a white male dream, of ever increasing wages ended. Real wages are what you can actually buy with your money, and before 1970, for 150 years, 1820 to 1970, each generation of white families did better than the generation before them. Even during the last Great Depression, prices sank faster than wages, and so the upward movement was maintained. By the 1970s, sophisticated telecommunications, computers, international competition, combined with broken class and communist and socialist-based political and labor unions in the United States allowed US jobs to be outsourced overseas without mobilized resistance. Without a strong based, <coughs> class-based movement and class-based anti-capitalist labor unions, capitalism operates without restraint. America is the poster child for that. When American jobs were outsourced, and American wages flattened in the 1970s, the reality of ever-increasing standards of living ended. Americans had gotten used to thinking as individuals. They believed they made it. They were quite, they were self-made men. They didn't see their gains for and by the work, as gains for and by a working class that has to come up together they saw that they could do it on their own. And they were rewarded for their hard work by ever increasing consumption. The prime token of their success was consumption. And they confused their self-worth as human beings with their net worth. Therefore, the US labor movement did not fight to collectively run their workplaces decide what to produce, how to produce it, or to share the profits they generated, they were content to get an ever-rising share of the profits they generated and keep consuming more goods. 
Increased consumption was the emblem of success, and they needed to maintain that level of consumption. I have to talk louder to no. feel important. They looked for personal and individual solutions to their problems as they had for 150 years. They worked longer hours. They took second jobs. En masse, they sent their wives into the labor force. Before that, white women entered the labor force in cases of divorce, which at that point was rare. Now it's a majority phenomenon in the United States, but it was rare, Dis some kind of disease, or desertion, or unemployment. Women's labor, which they thought would compensate for, for stagnating male wages, didn't do it. Crucial services that had never been counted before because women provided them, like laundering, cleaning, mending, cooking, child care and elder care and sick care, were expensive when they were purchased on the marketplace, and increasingly they had to be purchased in the marketplace. Social conditions are not in place in America to ease the burdens on marriage and on family when women work outside the home. Women, unlike any of their Western European counterparts, do not have any mass extensive subsidized quality daycare after school or time with sick relatives. We lack free health care, rent subsidies, child allowances, etc. Outsourced jobs mean that salaries are low, jobs are precarious, and people are left anxious and strained. In 2000, and that was before 2008, in 2008, the big recession struck. It struck deep and hard. It struck male jobs the hardest. Fully 75% of the jobs lost in the United States are male jobs, concentrated in machismo fields like construction, heavy machine, machinery, and aggressive finance, and aggressive big tag item sales like cars, industrial computers, etc. heavy machinery. American white men lost a good deal of the male hegemony that accompanied family wages and steady jobs. The U.S. economy has shifted. Men's greater physical strength and their greater aggression are far less welcome in a service-oriented economy. As women, we adjusted to our changed role in the marketplace. In 1974, only 40% of American women worked in the marketplace, mostly part-time. By now, close to 70% of American women work in the marketplace, mostly full-time and without supports. Unfortunately, our changed roles in the marketplace have not been matched by men's participation in childcare or home maintenance. The average unemployed man does less housework than his fully employed wife. To be fair to men, that work was characterized as shit work and therefore was not particularly attractive. <laughs> it was then and still is not understood what wisdom comes from maintaining life whether it's the physical basis for the life, that life or the emotional basis for that life, in conducting deeply with other people, with friends, with partners, with children. Emotional bonds happen to be critical and crucial to mental health at every level. It's one of the reasons that it's men who are cracking and killing vast numbers of people, 80 in one month that I measured, you know, because people lose their job or their wife leaves the two. Um, major motives and they shoot people feeling very masculine about it. They're essential, those skills are essential to the survival of infants and crucial to everyone else. Women have done the work to understand our traditional contributions but not only in an intuitive level. We have never spelled that out. We have never insisted that they be valorized 
both within the home and also in the marketplace. And as if men's problems were not difficult enough, remember, 75% of the jobs that have been lost have been male jobs. Women now occupy half of the nation's jobs, just about half, as well as the majority of the seats in higher education, which are crucial to other jobs. Women have responded to men's financial incapacity and their refusal to share equally in housework and childcare. U.S. women now increasingly <coughs> refuse to marry because they don't want men who can't provide eco economically and still want domestic and emotional services. Women now initiate 65% of the divorces as well as refuse to marry in the first place. The U.S. has the highest divorce rate in the world. We also have the weakest supports for families in the Western world. We can't stand the extra work of providing for men's emotional and physical needs while working outside the home because women have quadruple shifts. We have a shift in domestic labor, in emotional labor, in child care, and in jobs outside the home. And the state does not step in. The work is done by individual women who can't do it all. Men's roles are becoming obsolete. There are 15 rap most rapidly increasing jobs in the United States. Only two of those jobs are male jobs, janitor and computer engineer. The rest are female jobs in nursing, health care, child care, and food service. Nurturance <coughs> and the ability to cooperate fully and socially are also qualities associated with women and most in demand in what has become a social service economy, the American economy. An exclusively feminist movement doesn't make sense in this contact, context. Instead, we need a movement that inspires major transformation of both male and female relationships in a way that appeals to both men and women. And it's for that reason that an intergenerational, interracial, not that we were PC and planned it that way, it happened, but an interracial, racial, intergenerational group of people <coughs> created a platform and a program for which um, I'm grateful and which I will cite some of it now. It's a very long program, so it'll be very short what I'm gonna do. Yeah. One is universal health care. Second is maternity and paternity leave with compulsory paternity leave for men so they don't get extra credit for not bonding with their infants. Paid leave for sick children and family members. Public education from daycare to college. Paid vacation and personal time. Convenient access for families to low-cost nutritious food such as stores, markets, restaurants, subsidized house cleaning like they have in fancy condos, subsidized laundry services, subsidized quality child care, education for Americans about the skills and labor involved in caring for others both emotionally and physically, programs to value emotional labor so that extra income is provided for those jobs with an emotional labor component like daycare, early childhood education, and nursing. Daycare is now paid on par with parking lot attendant jobs, some of the lowest paid worst jobs in the United States. Free couple and whole family counseling centers in understanding and ser serving others emotionally as well as taking care of oneself. Addiction counseling that mandates an additional step to understand the social contribution to addictions of aggressive liquor lobbies, pharmaceutical lobbies, fashion lobbies, and pornog the pornography industry. Full gender equality in both household and also workplace labor. Subsidies for single mothers on all levels. 40% of American children 
are now born to single mothers, and the biggest increase is for whites. And I just have to tell you, though it's not exactly on, on the topic, that one of the best predictors of poverty in the United States is having a child. Comprehensive reproductive care and birth control assistance, education in the skills of creating and maintaining relationships and life beginning in kindergarten and going on through school and after school. All people need human connection in order to pursue and achieve happiness. These programs work to facilitate connections with people inside the home, in society, in the world. They also create thousands and thousands of jobs. These platform ideas begin a process of a platform for change that includes change in our daily and personal lives. Americans are very occupied with their personal lives above everything. And they will change, as of, of course, as people interact with these ideas in this platform, they'll change. People will recreate them and create their own platforms. And just as a hopeful idea, I'm now talking to the adult children of alcoholics that want to add some of these platform ideas to their daily um, guide. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 